Now I won't be going up anymore, just staying on the dub lake circuit, a semi level track. Well, they could do better with their, uh, they should have some timing markers on there, like forever, no way go back, <laughs> impossible. <laughs> You're not getting back before the sun goes down or something like that. <laughs> uh, but she did mention in the article, one thing that did stand out, she mentioned somewhere along here, she was pretty impressed by I think it was um, Bernard in some sort of sphagnum overhang or something, she said. And that sort of took me back to uh, some of the comments uh, in the South, South Welshman, uh, or New South uh, personage, uh, it, using the, the F. Scott Fitzgerald terminology. <laughs> um, they like to hang from cliff faces and things like that and grow in beds of sphagnum and things like that. So, and uh, I remember uh, the, the late Dennis Daly pointing out, he also wrote it into an article, but he also pointed it out to me over the phone. He was pretty impressed by some growing in, in some sphagnum or something in a creek where all, they're knotted together via their roots. So they're holding themselves together basically by their, uh, wow, somewhat fibrous root hairs, I suppose. I still, I still don't think we've got to the bottom of the root hairs on these kind of plants, because I do always like to point out to people that if you go to, back to that 1958 paper by Oostings and Oostings, apparently they got married later on, I don't know. It was after the post-war time, you know. It was probably a bit like after the Great War, the, the Roaring Twenties, you know, things happened, you know. <laughs> Who cares, sort of thing, you know. <laughs> anyway, so they they mentioned that the, you know, the Venus flytrap has long, persistent root hairs. You know, but what do they mean by long? What do they mean by persistent? Because anyone who starts off in a botany class, you always go through the peas and beans. And if you've ever seen the root hairs on a pea, on a pea or a bean, they, that's what I would class as long. Uh, for, for, so for someone to emphasise the fact that they're long and persistent means they must have been pretty impressive to someone who's seen and gone through anatomy classes with peas and beans. That's what I'm saying. So... Uh, and also goes to back to the fact that back in the 70s when I was starting off, Drosser Capensis used to have roots, you know, like pencil thick sized roots or even thicker. You know, like one of those texture felt tip pens or something like that. And they used to be, you know, either red or orangey red sort of thing and quite, quite hairy on the outside, but they weren't long root hairs, but... And I haven't really seen those since the 70s. Because when you go and talk to people, old, the old timers, as I say, uh, they tell you they used to just uh, grow them in natural soil, sort of thing. They used to just dig them up and uh, bring them back home and grow them that way. So, <laughs> a bit of naughty, naughty, but you only find out when they're about 77 years old and things like that. So, <laughs> well, then they're not long for the perch, sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, because as I said, Don, Donnie and I, I happened to be you know, riding around in the back of. A thing with the black and whites because you know Donnie was getting into it then I was saying you should read the black and whites are fantastic so there I was riding around in the back of his um, car with his black and white I had a membership list from back then and of course there was one of these old timers from my kind of plant society listed in the black and whites and we were actually driving down the street I said well let's just um, you know drop in and see if he's still there and lo and behold he was he was 77 years old and uh, he showed us some uh, giant um, terra stylus, uh, a giant form of the local terra stylus. So there's a lot out there that most general people don't know about. And um, that's when he mentioned uh, <laughs> everyone used, back then used to grow it in, na in native soil. You know, none of this peat and sand, peat and sand that we've been, you know, subcultured into 
<laughs> doing, you know, taught to be slack, basically, in a way. Uh, no wonder they, they had much better plants than we had. They were growing them in natural soil. So basically what I'm saying is that the hobby's not going to move on until we learn what's going on in the ecology out here with the, with the native soil that makes the plants grow so well out here. And once we've learned how to do that, we'll be able to move on, uh, go on and be on nature, basically, and grow them better than they grow in the wild. You know, bigger, faster, and more colorful. And that also goes back to that time in the uh, uh, middle, middle 90s or something. I went, oh, was it late? I don't know. It's on the, it was on my slides. I went down to photograph some person's plants and I walked in this greenhouse and there was this giant banana there. And it took me back to that statement by Charles Darwin saying you know, he had this thing that grew to 80 centimeters. And I thought, you know, is that really possible? Walked in in this greenhouse and there was a exemplar specimen of something of that sort of stature growing in his greenhouse. And he was very cagey about it. All he would say is he got it in a lump of soil from some lady in the southeast. I think I know who the lady is. I think we all know who the lady is. <laughs> but that's what he would say. And of course it was in a lump of soil. So I assume that was natural native soil, just like the old timers used to just grow their plants. No wonder they didn't have any of the, the, the disease problems that we have in peat and sand, peat and sand, and were we actually really using real peat, you know? Oh, the people down under won't know what, peat, what real peat is, what the real smell is, what it looks like, blah, blah, blah. We'll just sort of start mixing off with coil or something like that, or, you know, ball rushes or something, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, lo and behold, we had so much trouble growing plants back then. I mean, I could even grow plants, native plants, not, not two basketball courts from my house. I had the native plants growing, and I couldn't even match the look. I mean, in, in peat and sand, so, you know. Yeah, recanting of a life history. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah. So there we go. So seeing out when I've walked past a whole patch of bananas and I've been gas bagging so much that I've missed them. <laughs> and I have to come back tomorrow to film them again. But I just thought like you like to know, you know. And of course on top of all this, you have all the commercial places plugging out these things and you think, oh god, I mean we had dinner size. Mexican pingwickelers, you know, growing to the size of dinner plates coming, coming out from Victoria around the new millennium. They've obviously discovered something about how to grow Mexican pingwickelers. <laughs> but has it filtered through to the, uh, you know, to, to the hobbyists, to the general public? No. So, anyway. Oh, that's very Nordic, Scandinavian. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, it is a pleasant walk anyway. And oh, yeah, well, it's so much better with the dark glasses off, fellas. <laughs> yeah.